Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. Today, we're diving into the highlights from ASH 2024. I am Rahul Gosain, here with my brother and co-host, Rohit Gosain. In this discussion, our focus is going to be on key studies in leukemia from ASH 2024. To cover all this, we're joined by Dr. Uma Barade from the Ohio State University. Uma, it was so good to see you, Ash. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. It's great to be here. Well, welcome, Uma. I hope you're getting settled in after Ash Blue's here. Well, for the next 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to be touching on multiple studies, starting out with the first study on menin inhibitor, Comet 007, and the last two studies will be focusing on induction therapies, one with CPX351 and the other, which are wet menvase therapies. To start off with our first uh, study, Comet 007, and very interesting and a catchy name, it's a phase one study, which is on menin inhibitor, Ziftomenib. Historically, we've stayed away from covering early phase studies, especially it takes years for approval, and then it takes a while for communities to, to get settled in with that. But this study reiterates the importance of NGS, and menin inhibitors are here to stay. We have seen recent approval of Revumenib, which was approved for relapse refractory with KMT2A translocation. The COMET-007, which is rather two studies, one with Ziftomenib in frontline with 7 plus 3 induction, and then we'll briefly touch on second in relapsed refractory settings with Azaven, starting out with the first one, ma'am, uh, which is Ziftomenib in frontline with 7 plus 3. Yeah, so um, I, I agree. I think this year Ash at Ash, the menin inhibitors were, you know, the big news in acute myeloid leukemia because exactly what you said they are a very specific targeted therapy. They're oral agents, and they're targeted towards patients with AML that have an NPM1 mutation or a KMT2A rearrangement, which is different from a mutation. It's obviously a, a chromosomal or abnormality detected typically by FISH, and it's usually this 11Q23 partner that can partner with many different um, but, but many different partners. So you can have, you know, a 9, 11, 11, 17. There can just be multiple partners of this KMT2A um, rearrangement, which then makes that leukemia very susceptible to menin inhibition. And in the menin inhibitor session, we saw several menin inhibitors, right? You saw, as you mentioned, Revumenib, which just was approved in the relapsed refractory KMT2A to a mutated AML scenario. You had Bleximenib, you had Enzomenib, and then you had Ziftomenib, which is the Comet 001 study you're um, showing right now. I think this study was really interesting because as you mentioned, this very specifically talked about the frontline setting. So patients who are fit for induction, who have either NPM1 or KMT2A rearranged leukemia, um, however, they did mention that for the dose escalation phase, which is what was presented, these patients had to have adverse risk. So even in the NPM1 setting, which we think of as favorable, they have to have something that makes them adverse risk. Maybe another, you know, negative rearrangement, something that makes them not the straightforward favorable risk NPM1. And we saw that when ziftomenib was combined at different dose levels, starting with 200, which was dose level one, all the way to 600, you saw these very remarkable responses. You had a composite complete remission rate of over 90%. And I think the interesting thing in that is all of them were actual complete remission. So just a reminder for people listening, a complete remission is when you have complete count recovery, your platelets are over 100,000, your ANC is over 1,000. These are the most you know, deep remissions that you can expect after induction therapy. This was true for patients with NPM1 mutations, which you might say, well, you know, they usually do well. But I think the other thing that was very remarkable is people with KMT2A rearrangements also had really high composite complete remissions of 83%. And again, you know, all of them were complete remissions, like a true CR. Um, so to me, this was really impressive because when you looked at the toxicity, 
you really did not see additional toxicity to so what you see in seven and three inductions. You had your febrile neutropenia, you had some nausea, you had some diarrhea. I would say the other thing that we worry about with menin inhibitors as a class, they are high risk for differentiation syndrome. This was seen, but not at you know grade four and grade five, which is what you worry about because that means these patients are in the ICU or, you know, unfortunately died from a differentiation, which did not happen in the study. So just a summary, I think combinations in the frontline setting with intensive induction in NPN1 and KMT2A AML look very, very promising with manageable toxicities and really impressive response rates. So I think as, as you mentioned, you know, we real, this is an early phase study, right? They are going expanding this um, in the future that was mentioned in the presentation. And I think that's really what we're all waiting to see, because if that is a positive study, these menin inhibitors are here to stay. Uma, can I push you a little more? You did touch on differentiation syndrome. We know this is usually very steroid sensitive. Is that the case here as well, that these patients often respond to steroids? Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, you know, we, we're now a little bit more familiar with differentiation syndrome. We knew about it from ATRA with APL. Then we learned about it again with our IDH inhibitors. And now we're learning about it again with menin inhibitors. Um, it's typically seen by week two of therapy, and this is more in the monotherapy setting. It's much less when you combine it with, you know, chemotherapy, as you can imagine. And absolutely, the treatment is steroids, typically dexamethasone um, and hydrea to, com to control this abrupt white cell count increase and prevent these cells from entering tissues and causing pulmonary, neurological, and other symptoms. And then before we move on to our next study, I think I want to reiterate, Roy, you brought this up as well. NGS testing is very, very important in these settings. And then touching on azavenetoclax with ziftomenib. We often worry about the side effects with azavenetoclax already in community settings. Uma, your thoughts here? I, I don't disagree. I mean, I, I think you have to have a lot of respect for aza and venetoclax um, as a combination therapy. And I do think we have more work to do to understand how to combine any additional targeted therapy, whether it's ziftomenib, whether it's another menin inhibitor, whether it's, you know, targeted agents like ivocidinib or enosidinib. And I think we do see when you combine anything with aza -ven, you do see a little bit more prolonged cytopenias, more time to recovery. Um, and in this relapsed refractory setting, um, which was presented by Dr. Fati, you did see that patients did get responses. They were much higher in the NPM1 population, much more durable, not as high in the KMT2A rearranged leukemia. Now remember, this was a relapsed refractory cohort, so that is expected. And you did, did see some delayed count recovery. So again, I think this is an early study. I think there's a you know a lot more work to be done. But as you reiterated, we now have a whole new targeted therapy for two different mutations, rearrangements that we were not really targeting. So knowing by NGS that your patient has an NPM1 mutation, knowing by FISH and or cytogenetics that your patient has a KMT2A rearrangement is going to be critical. And I think the important thing is if you know this at diagnosis, most, if not all patients, when they relapse, they will have the same rearrangement or mutation. They might have additional abnormalities, but these mutations are typically very stable. So knowing that from the get-go, I think is going to be critical. Now, moving on to our next study here, a common question that we often run into is liposomal formulation, CPX351. Is this any better than our historic 7 plus 3 induction? And we've gone back and forth. The cost also ends up being a big barrier. Uma, your thoughts here and the findings for this study? I, I don't disagree. I think it still is something that, you know, we debate all the time because we know that the current approval label for CPX351, also known as Vixios, is in myelodysplasia-related AML. So AML that emerge from MDS-related mutations we know from the pivotal phase three study that when these patients got CPX351 or Vixios as opposed to seven and three, which was a comparator arm, 
they had, you know, better remission rates and more importantly, better overall survival. However, this has really been credited to the fact that more of these patients ended up going to transplant because they're high risk for relapse and therefore their survival was increased because CPX351 seemed to be able to get patients to transplant better than 7 and 3. And the study that you're referencing at this ASH really showed that if you try to tease out what that looks like, the patients that really seem to benefit from CPX351 or Vixios are patients that have these MR or MDS-like mutations. So spliceosome mutations, ASXL1, but not so much TP53, not so much de novo AML patients. Um, and these MR, MDS-like mutations really had the maximum benefit with Vixios. And so I do think this is somewhat practice informing because now when I go back and I see a patient, you know, and the trial, um, just to remind your audience, was done in patients 60 and older. Yes. But this benefit was seen with the study in anybody, any age group that had these specific kind of group of mutations. So I do think it informs your practice if you're deciding what frontline induction therapy to give patients. Again, you know, knowing what the NGS looks like, knowing if they have these specific mutations, and then making that decision up front because you know that it's going to help them get to remission and then to transplant. Absolutely. And we know historically that this particular population tends to have poor prognosis and especially now combined with prolonged cytopenias and managing that, especially sometimes even in the elderly where this even gets more serious. I think that's always been a challenge with Pixios. The cytopenias are, as you said, definitely prolonged. They, they last over 30 to 35 days on average. Um, a lot of our patients end up in the hospital or are in the hospital when they receive this therapy. Um, and and it, it just is something you have to be very mindful of when you induce these patients. It's not something that, you know, I think um, is it, it's not as the, the count recovery is not as predictable as seven and three. All right. Switching gears again to touch on combination treatment options in frontline settings. Yes, attacking the known driver mutation early on is important, like we just talked about, but not all our patients have this mutation. So about the majority of these patients that don't have actionable mutations, we're looking at venetoclax being combined with adduction chemotherapy. We're also seeing venetoclax being combined with these actionable mutations. Here we're seeing it with IDH. We just covered a menin inhibitor. Whom are your thoughts here with venetoclax being up front? Yeah, I think, um, you know, <laughs> to me, I think vanilloclax is, is, is a little bit like, you know, hot sauce with everything you eat. You know, it just adds that little bit of kick to anything that you essentially do. And I, and I think it's a very, very potent agent that's synergistic with azavin. It's synergistic with 7 and 3. It's synergistic with uh, a regimen that you're showing on your slide in abstract 1517, which we call the clear regimen, cladribine. Idorubicin and cytarabine, all given at attenuated doses for older patients. And then when you combine it with venetoclax in that first week, um, or if you combine it with a triplet like azacitidine, venetoclax, plus ivocidinib, um, when combined together for IDH1 mutations, we definitely see increased composite CR. You also see, I think we're seeing a trend, especially with the CLIA VIN regimen of increased um, event-free survival. We don't have randomized studies in any of these scenarios to say, do these MRD negative remissions then translate into an overall survival benefit? That's, I think, what I would want to see if I were to change my practice and add venetoclax to any of these um, you know, triplets, as we call them, 7 plus 3 plus venetoclax, CLIA plus venetoclax, or Azaven plus, you know, targeted therapies. I really think having that information is going to be key because it comes at a cost. And the cost is always toxicity, right? It's always the prolonged cytopenias. And I think for your audience, if you're trying to do this and you are doing this in the community setting, that can definitely be more challenging. 
Indeed, as you stated, the vanilla clax is one of those uh, great analogy with the hot sauce there. But in we are, at least in community, we are used to utilizing vanilla clax, whether that's in CLL or combining with hypomethylating agents um, in AML space. Uh, but longer term studies, randomized studies, and importantly, overall survival data will dictate how we're going to utilize this. Now, with the side effect profile, as you mentioned, a bit of cytopenias, uh, TLS, tumor lysis syndrome, is definitely right up on the list. Any other clinical pearls around venetoclax? I think the biggest clinical pearl that I would recommend or, or, or think of when you're doing this is the drug-drug interactions. And I will say almost all of my patients on venetoclax are going to be on some sort of CYP34 interacting agents. Sometimes it's the decision of which antifungal to give them, right? If you give them an azole that's a strong CYP34 interactor like posaconazole, you're decreasing the dose of venetoclax to 70. Some of us just do 100. Similarly for voriconazole, you know, you, you have to make those decisions. But I also want to let people know a, a pearl that I think is really important is there's several cardiac medications and other sort of um, antiemetics and other medications that have subtle interactions with venetoclax. I, I always ask our pharmacist, hey, can you just look at the patient's med list real quick? Just take do a quick review. Do I have to dose reduce anything else? Because these are older patients, you're treating them with chemo, they're on all these other medications, and before you know it, you know, there's an interaction that you weren't even aware of. These are exciting times as we see AML just completely evolve and turn into this precision medicine, poster child, as Rohit called it, and we have more and more treatment options that are going to be available soon. Uma, thank you so much for taking the time to cover these important studies from ASH 2024 in leukemia. For our listeners, keep an eye out for more discussions around lymphoma, CLL, and myeloma from ASH 2024. Before that, let us go over a quick recap from this discussion. In today's discussion with Dr. Uma Barare from the Ohio State University, we had a chance to cover three key abstracts from ASH 2024 focusing in leukemia. Starting off with Comet 007 for Ziftominib, a Newmanin inhibitor. Then we also touched on CPX351 versus our usual 7 plus 3 induction. And then we closed off with the Neptoclax based combinations upfront in AML. A common theme in AML is the importance of NGS testing, as we now have few targetable mutations in this disease site. Menin inhibitors are already approved, and keeping an eye out for NPM1 or KMT2A is important. 7 plus 3 induction over CPX351 still remains a viable option for most of our patients for induction till we wait larger data from venetoclax based combinations in this settings. Thanks for joining us. We are the Oncology Brothers.